Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Shauna Smith along with Akiko Fujita. Let's get you up to speed on the market action. We're looking at the Dow trading to the upside up just about 220 points. S&P also holding on to gains. You can see the NASDAQ, the only laggard of the three averages here, off just about a tenth of a percent. The outperformance today, financials, the top performing sector here, a lot of the big banks, many of the banks moving to the upside following the results of the stress test last night. Names like JP Morgan, Goldman, Wells Fargo, all up at least 3%. Well, the Fed is also in focus here. Fed Chair Jay Powell saying overnight that he's monitoring the banking industry, quote, very carefully, while staying hawkish on the central bank's policy. At an event held by the Spanish Central Bank, Powell once again signaled that more rate hikes are likely necessary to get a better handle on inflation. We want to bring in Kevin Mon, Chief Investment Officer at Hennion and Walsh. Kevin, it's great to see you again. So once again, well. Powell being very hawkish, as we could say, just in terms of the fact of what could maybe be necessary to get inflation under control. Yes. You're not buying it. You don't think I'm we'll not. see another rate hike. Why? I don't think we should see another rate hike. In fact, I think the Fed should have hiked in May and then go away. We haven't even seen the full extent of the damage to the U.S. economy of the first 500 basis points in rate hikes. We paused in June. Now we're going to come back in July and hike again. What's changed from June to July? I recognize inflation is well above their target, but it's likely to remain well above their target for the next couple of years. So my concern is if they continue to raise rates aggressively, that's going to push the economy into a deeper and perhaps more protracted recession than would have otherwise occurred on its own. And yet, Kevin, since the FOMC meeting, we have heard the Fed chair have a very consistent message saying essentially the rate hikes are not over, even if they come at a moderated pace. So, I mean, what's your sense? Is he just dangling this over the market? Well, it's a, it's a possibility? good question, Akiko. You remember, there's three tools in the Fed's arsenal to help combat inflation. One is the Fed funds target rate, which they've now raised short-term interest rates 500 basis points over the course of the last 15 months. Two is the size of their balance sheet, which they continue to shrink to the tune of about $95 billion per month. And their third tool is their rhetoric. And that rhetoric is in full force right now. So I'm still in the camp that in all likelihood, they should be done with this rate hike cycle, although we may see one more 25 basis point hike between now and the year end. But regardless, we're at the end of this rate hike cycle. And I believe in all likelihood this time next year, we're going to be talking about rate cuts, not rate hikes. This time next year, you think we'll be talking about rate cuts. I know a lot of the expectations for rate cuts have been pushed out well into 2024. I want to go back, though, to what you said just a moment ago, and that was about recession. If we do see two more rate hikes, you mentioned a pos the potential for a severe recession. How severe? What does that look like for the equity markets? Well, let me put it this way. 70% of our economic growth comes from consumer spending. We know that the consumer continues to spend. The labor market is relatively strong. But we also know that the consumer continues to dip into their personal savings and put more in their credit cards to help keep up these inflated prices. Last year alone, Shona, $180 billion worth of new credit card debt was put on the books, a record total. The average over the last 10 years is only $43 billion per year. We also know that credit card interest rates are near 21 percent, an all-time high. If the Fed continues to raise interest rates, that's only going to make the cost of paying off that credit debt even higher, and that's going to slow down the economy. So, Kevin, we've got a majority of S&P 500 stocks now up on the start of the year. Can we expect more market breadth, though? We've been talking so much about the concentration in the tech plays, but it's starting to broaden out. It's starting to broaden out. But though I will point out that if you look at the three major indexes at the midway point of the year, NASDAQ up around a 30% year to date. It's best first half since 1983. The S&P 500 up over 14%, well ahead all most major analyst predictions for the entire year of 2023. But the Dow up only 2% year to date because the Dow hasn't been riding the coattails of those seven mega cap technology stocks. We need to see more breadth in this rally to be feel comfortable that this is, in fact, a bull market rally. I think we will see that during the second half of the year, unless the Fed stays too aggressive. And Kevin, when we think about the themes, really, of the first half of the year, a lot of the focus has been on the Fed. And then yep. when you take a look at the equity market, the outperformers there, a lot of that focus has been on AI. What do you think are going to be the key themes here or the key focus for investors in the second half? Is it pretty much similar to what we've seen over the last six months? Similar, yes. So AI is certainly the new hot dot on Wall Street, mm -hmm. but I would just recall back to the 2000s during the dot-com crash, 
all of the hype and euphoria around dot com and the internet back then. And I would just advise investors to be very cautious before jumping into those AI waters. Make sure you know who you're investing in, make sure they're committed to AI, make sure they're profitable, and make sure they have strong balance sheets. There's two ways you can play AI, right? You can take the larger cap names, the Microsofts with their multi billion dollar commitment to open AI chat GBT, or even IBM, who earlier this week announced a significant $4.6 billion acquisition of Aptio. Those are the bigger cap names. But let's look at some smaller cap names, too, who are really driving and using AI. ADRs, like Nice Limited, or even Opera Limited. Opera Limited has their own native web browser using AI based in Norway, and they also pay an attractive dividend. So there's gonna be more than one winner to the AI race, AI race, so take your time, do your due diligence, blend US and international, and blend large cap and small cap. We think that's the diversification to play AI. Uh, well, what's the checklist you think investors should be going for? Is it the profitability of these companies? Is it the valuations? You're looking at some of the smaller names, but what's to say those will have similar upside? I think you first and foremost need to look at those companies that have expertise and commitment to the AI space. In other words, they're not just suggesting that they're in AI or developing AI, but have a commitment to that space and the investment in the balance sheet to support that. You also have to look at valuations, as you point out. Look at the strength of their balance sheet. Make sure they haven't taken on too much debt, which is gonna impede their ability to be profitable. AI's got a long way to go. So consider AI in the context of other revolutionary technologies, such as robotics, the Internet of Things, cybersecurity, 5G, FinTech. There are different ways that you can play the race in uh, technology that we think can benefit growth-oriented investors, not just for the balance of this year, but for the next decade. Kevin, how much of that excitement is already priced into some of these larger names? You mentioned Microsoft, their position right now in AI, given the partnership with uh, OpenAI. How much of that, though, has already been priced in, given the run-up that we've seen? Yeah, Microsoft is one of the more fairly valued, and I'll put that in quotes, uh, of the big cap names right now, trading at a multiple, I believe, of around 37. I know that doesn't sound like it's attractively valued, but relative to NVIDIA, it certainly is. IBM? They are really investing a lot into this space right now. Seven acquisitions this year alone, 30 acquisitions since the new CEO took over, plus they have a dividend of over 5%. So I think there's much more opportunity ahead, but look for those companies with a commitment to the space, cash to spend, and also attractive balance sheet. IBM, Microsoft both fit that bill, but maybe there's even more growth in those smaller cap names. All right, we will see what the performance looks like in the second half of the year. Kevin Mann, thanks so much. My pleasure, Shona. Well, shares of Savers Value Village soaring in its debut today. The stock is up nearly 30% now. The for-profit thrift store retailer has been dominating the space for decades. Today, it has more than 300 locations in the U.S., Canada, and Australia. Let's bring in Savers Value Village CEO Mark Walsh. Uh, Mark, congratulations on the debut. We're talking about a huge debut today, but your company has been around for nearly 70 years. Why yep, come to market years. now? A lot of things, uh, great secular trends, thrift, value, uh, an oversized TAM opportunity, total addressable market of over 2,200 stores. You know, a really differentiated business model that creates a massive competitive moat for us. And look, I think of that where we are with our, uh, with our private equity sponsor, it's the right time for us to, to make, this, uh, make this jump. Mark, how does your business fare in an economy like the one that we're seeing today? Lots of talk about a recession, that growth is significantly slowing. What does it mean for savers? Are you guys, to an extent, recession-proof? At an average AUR of $5, it's extreme value. We're, you know, if you go back to the, the uh, Great Recession of 07, 08, business performed exceptionally well. Over the last 15 years, Positive same store sales comp every year other than the uh, 2020 uh, COVID year. So we're pretty confident that we'll, we'll uh, perform well through any economic environment. Currently our transactions have been exceptionally strong. We feel great about our, uh, our connection with our thrifters and feel really good about the future in terms of continuing that, uh, that ability to connect with the folks who come and shop with us.
Yeah, in, in addition to a softer economy potentially working in your favor, you've also got a demographic shift that's happening. Younger consumers increasingly more conscious about where they're buying from. We've seen a huge push or huge growth in the secondhand market in that space too. What are you seeing across your stores? We are seeing exactly that as well. Our loyalty member base is 4.7 million. Our new members who are joining are skewing much younger. Really excited about that. Obviously, that's great for a brand. Anytime your influx of new customers who are joining your, your membership program are younger. So we're seeing that exactly, that same exact trend. Mark, what do you think is driving that beyond the fact that they're just a little bit more conscious about where they are getting their clothing from? Is it just in terms of the cost? Is it also just indicative of inflationary pressures and what's going on more broadly speaking? Well, I think there's, a, there's certainly an element of cost that's associated with that trend. But then there's a, there's a level of authenticity in what we represent. What we hear from our thrifters is they want an environment that's fun. They love the treasure hunt. You know, we put out 33,000 new items per store per average week. Uh, and then you add to that um, you know, a turn of 15 times. So our average thrifter, when they come in, they see a fresh environment almost every time. So the, the, the treasure hunt experience really drives, I think, additional motivation and additional uh, shopper stickiness. Uh, we've seen a number of online thrift stores that could potentially be your competitors. We're talking about names like ThreadUp as well as Poshmark. Yep. How are you thinking about your digital footprint? Uh, when it comes to e-commerce, we, we invested a lot of time and energy understanding what that could mean for us. At $5 AURs, it's not a good use of capital. So we have no plans to invest in an e-commerce space. Our focus is going to be around brick and mortar. In fact, 70% of thrifters that we've surveyed indicate that brick and mortar is where they want to shop. It's fun, it's energizing, they like the experience better than online. Well, investors certainly energized as well, uh, at least based on the stock move that we've seen today. Mark Walsh, Savers Value Village CEO, good to talk to you today, appreciate the time. Thank you very much, nice to talk to you. We are just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, the Supreme Court striking down affirmative action in university admissions. We're gonna get reaction from California Congresswoman Maxine Waters next. Plus, the Wall Street Journal now reporting the Chinese balloon that passed over the U.S. earlier this year used American equipment. We look at the implications from the rising tensions with China later this hour. And Nike set to report earnings after the bell. We're going to dive into the numbers from the retail giant in our 4 p.m. hour. Stick around. Much more coming up here on Yahoo Finance.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Jennifer Schoenberger. Well, U.S. lawmakers are making waves after the U.S. Supreme Court ruled to curb affirmative, affirmative action for universities' admission processes. All this as lawmakers are also scurrying to crack down further on crypto, as well as look at how to regulate artificial intelligence. For more on this, joining me now is Representative Maxine Waters, the top Democrat on the House Financial Services Committee. Congresswoman Waters, thank you so much for joining me. It's great to see you. I'm delighted to be with you today. Before we get into AI, I want to get your reaction on the Supreme Court ruling, which essentially banned affirmative action from university process, admission processes in this country. Uh, being that you represent California, you have seen firsthand how this could play out, given that California banned affirmative action for public universities some 25 years ago. How do you see this playing out now with this federal ruling? Well, of course, I'm very disappointed uh, in the Supreme Court. You know, going way back to Lyndon Johnson, oh, I guess back uh, about 1961, uh, that's when he implemented affirmative action. And I think by 1968 or so, the Supreme Court ruled that race could be a factor, not everything, but a factor in considering, uh, you know, whether or not uh, it could be used on college applications to determine whether or not the student is eligible to go to that institution. And so, you know, but up until about 2000, the Supreme Court was basically supporting uh, that fact that there had been discrimination in education and certainly race could be a factor. But I want you to know, as you perhaps already know, uh, that there's been a right wing attack on affirmative action on using race as one factor uh, for the last 20 years or so. And so they've come to the point where they've got a Supreme Court now uh, that would do their bidding. And so the conservatives win on this, despite the fact uh, that you know, there is still a need uh, to use race as a factor for black and brown students who have been traditionally uh, discriminated against. You know, these students are not coming from rich families. They're not coming from legacy families. These are ones who have worked hard uh, to be able to enter into the finest institutions in this country, but they are not going to have that opportunity if race is not one of the considerations. It is unfortunate. It is a win for the right-wing conservative elements uh, that have been out to destroy this for a long time. And I'm just hoping uh, that the struggle that we're gonna have to continue, we must continue, will get us back uh, where we can have some equality uh, in the opportunities to be educated. Do you think legislation is in order to reverse this ruling? Uh, well, I certainly think that whatever we can do, and certainly legislation would be in order. Uh, it would be great if finally the Supreme Court would recognize uh, that perhaps they have not made the right decision and sometime in the near future would alter that. I don't expect that's going to happen, but we're going to struggle. We're going to fight. We're going to do everything we possibly can. All right, we'll turn and that to is AI. Not comfortable in the leadership of this. All right, Congresswoman, well, now turning to AI, uh, you have called on, on yeah. House Financial Services Chair Patrick McHenry to hold a hearing really as soon as possible on Microsoft's chat GPT, as well as other advancements in AI, and really understand the risks and perhaps dangers that present themselves to the financial and housing sectors. Have you heard from Chair McHenry on this? Can we expect a hearing on AI anytime soon? I've not heard, but yes, I did send a letter to him indicating that I would very much support a hearing on AI. As a matter of fact, AI is getting ahead of the Congress's ability uh, to regulate and to make sure uh, that consumers are not taken advantage of, uh, that we get the truth and that the biases already in algorithms uh, would not uh, be what would cause problems in AI. And so I want this hearing very much. I think it is absolutely necessary. And I think we have to be concerned about who is doing it. And I just heard, uh, you know, just on your program uh, a few minutes ago, a caution uh, about uh, investing 
uh, in AI without knowing everything about the company that one might want to invest in. Uh, because some are strong, uh, they have the resources that are necessary uh, to deliver the product, but others may not be in that situation. So we really need to get started on making sure that we have regulations that will protect everyone. Well, on that, Congresswoman, you led a task force for four years on AI. How do you think Congress should regulate AI? What does regulation look like for AI? Well, you know, that's one of the things um, we tried to discover with the task force that was held, uh, led by Mr. Foster, uh, the congressman uh, that had the responsibility uh, to take a look and see what they could determine. And they learned a lot of, about AI. But I'll give you an example of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, who really believes uh, that it is important uh, that we get ahead of, our, of uh, AI on this so that the consumers who would be utilizing AI uh, to give responses to questions about uh, what the law is and uh, how they are to respond to it and what they can do in order to get relief uh, when they are being you know, taken advantage of. If we're to have uh, good information, if we're to have the kind of information that will certainly protect you know, the consumers, we've got to make sure that the AI does not have biases, for example, uh, that would harm them. So whether we're talking about consumer a financial Protection Bureau or education or housing, we must have the kind of regulations that will ensure that we're not going backwards, uh, that we're not harming our consumers and our would-be homeowners, but we're giving them the information that they need in order to be successful in what they're attempting to do. Do you think Congress needs to create a new agency to oversee the development and implementation of AI and really ongoing monitoring of it? Or do you think individual agencies can create um, enclaves within them for whatever the various sector is to oversee them? Uh, there's a lot of debate going on about that. And I know there are those who lean toward not having a new regulatory agency and think perhaps it should go into the SEC. I'm leaning toward a separate agency. Even though my staff and I have not really gotten together on this, I do believe that this technology is so new and is so different and we've got to teach people about the chat box and the black box and all of that, that we really do need a separate agency in order to do what needs to be done in order to have the regulations that are necessary for this new technology. And so there's a difference of opinion uh, by many on this right now. It certainly has not been decided, uh, but that's how I feel about it. Uh, Congresswoman, a report on 60 Minutes earlier this year showed a machine developed by Google was able to learn the language of Bangladesh and then start translating in Bengali. And Google was not aware of really how the machine did that. So who's to say that this machine, which is run by Google, uh, many of us use its search engine, uh, use Gmail, uh, could go and start uh publicly making public people's personal financial information. And the fact that Google doesn't really know at this point how that's happening, how do we create guardrails against that? Well, I think you hit it right where it should be noted uh, that we don't know all of the dangers of AI. We don't know uh, the creations that they could do. Um, and I think that we have to be cautious, we have to be very careful, uh, we have to have regulations. We should get on it right away. It's taken us a little bit too long, uh, but you're absolutely correct. We don't know what could be created um, in the way that we have seen some of the creations that you identified. And turning to crypto, Republicans on the House Financial Services Committee have put forth a discussion draft bill on a framework to regulate crypto. Uh, where do you stand on that legislation and how are things going as well on the stablecoin bill? Well, um, there has been a bipartisan effort on stable coins. We have worked together uh, to come up with the kind of regulations and oversight that is needed. 
uh, it, we stopped a bit on the last break that we had, but we're very close. And I do think that we can get a bipartisan piece of legislation that will ensure on stable coins uh, that the companies have the assets that they claim to have in order to protect you know, the consumers that are investing. And so when we talk about crypto, actually stable coins in the forefront of anything else that we need to do is on the road to some possibilities of getting uh, the kind of regulations that's needed. And so I'm very hopeful uh, about stable coins, but when we get into the larger crypto, there's still a lot of work to be done. I know that Mr. McHenry uh, is trying to come up uh, with some other efforts to deal with crypto, but we're certainly not there yet. All right. Well, Congresswoman Waters, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. Thank you so much for your insight. Hope to speak with you again soon. Well, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. That's Congresswoman Maxine Waters, the top Democrat on the House Financial Services Committee. And we'll be right back. The U.S. is considering new restrictions on AI chip shipments to China, according to a report from The Wall Street Journal. This as concerns mount over the possible threat of an advanced AI in the hands of U.S. rivals. Shipments to China from chipmakers like NVIDIA could be blocked by the Commerce Department as early as next month. Chipmaker shares falling pre-market on the report. I think this is where the rubber meets the road, and I think AI is a great story. I think it's hard to argue against the fact that it could change the world. 
But these bumps happen when we're talking about new technologies, and this is a very new trend. So I would tell investors that, you know, this is kind of part of the process. This is the world figuring out where AI fits, and there are going to be ups and downs. This group has had an unbelievable run, and, and, and whether it be the AI stocks in general or the chip stocks uh, in particular as well. So it'll be interesting, not only this week, but as we move into next week, a lot of these institutions, they might start to pull back a little bit because of this concern. Because there's concern about whether the Biden administration is going to put any restrictions on the ability of these companies to export their goods, then those valuation levels could come in. There's plenty of profits to take off the table. Might an air pocket be coming if that's the direction the Biden administration wants to go? Certainly, that's something you can't rule out. I spoke to one strategist over at Baird, Ted Mortensen, who basically said that this is turning out to look like into almost a geopolitical economic warfare issue. When you are restricting the exportation of these chips, you are basically trying to restrict economic growth in one country, and you're also trying to restrict their military advancements. This is going to be sort of a red line when it comes to uh, China in trying to restrict this. We're taking off into a big travel weekend ahead with AAA predicting a record number of Americans planning to travel for July 4th weekend. So what does this mean for travel stocks? For more on this, let's turn to Yahoo Finance's Ines Frey, who's closely tracking some of the movement that we're seeing today in airlines. Yeah, that's right, Shauna. And we are seeing a little bit of mixed action when it comes to the airlines. Our Wi-Fi interactive board will show you here. You can see a mixed picture here. But look, this 4th of July weekend is really going to be the test for the flight system for the airlines. Record travelers, as you just mentioned, uh, AAA saying that 4.1 million Americans will be flying. That's 11 percent more than last year, 6 percent more than in 2019. There's already been hiccups happening. That's right. Uh, in, in New York airports, there's been some flight cancellations over the last couple of days, thunderstorms along the northeast. Uh, some of the airlines are saying, look, this is because of weather conditions. It's also because of the FAA. They're blaming the FAA because of staffing issues with air traffic control, staffing uh, problems. And we have seen seen that scenario before. I do want to point out also what's been happening with the cruise lines because they have seen quite a bump. This is a year-to-date chart you can see on our travel chart here. So you see the airlines and the cruise lines carnival up 112% year-to-date. I'm going to pull up, though, a five-day chart because it still hasn't recovered from its pre-pandemic levels. That mean, I mean the stock, by the way, because Carnival, in its latest quarterly uh, earnings calls, talked about booking volumes reaching an all-time high. In in the second quarter, booking volumes were 17% higher than in 2019. Remember that the uh, cruise liners really suffered during the pandemic, and they had been, it's a slow kind of um, path to recovery for them. But over the last year, they really have skyrocketed, especially after they also took out the restrictions for vaccines for people to be able to travel on those ships. So you have seen a huge bump when it comes to these travel stocks all around. The question is, will this last? Will people continue to travel if we see the economy slowing down? Yeah, and as we spoke to uh, Josh Weinstein, the CEO of Carnival, earlier this week, and he was saying that they're just scratching the surface right now. He doesn't think that demand's going to slow down anytime soon, but we will see. All right, Ines Frey, thanks. Well, gas prices have been steadily declining, with the national average now at $3.55 a gallon. That is welcome news, with nearly 40% of drivers planning a road trip over the July 4th weekend. That's at least according to Gas Buddy's new summer travel survey that marks a 9% jump from last year. For more, let's bring, uh, let's welcome in Patrick DeHaan, Gas Buddy head of petroleum analysis. Patrick, what does this all mean in terms of the demand picture? Well, you know, a lot of Americans have started to make the transition in light of last year's record setting prices. Some Americans have made the transition over EVs. It probably won't be a record setting holiday weekend for gasoline consumption. There are still some slowdowns that we're seeing when it comes to gasoline consumption. And so uh, I would look for gasoline demand to be about 9.4 million barrels. That's still one of the higher numbers that we've seen so far this year. But that's going to be down from about 10 million barrels that we saw back in 2019. So still a lot of Americans hitting the road. Gas prices now a dollar and 35 cents on average below what they were a year ago. That's going to save Americans about $20 every time they fill their tank up. 
uh, most welcome is 47 of the nation's 50 states seeing average prices over a dollar a gallon less than what we saw a year ago. Patrick, you just mentioned the average price there, 355. There was talk going into the summer that we could retest four bucks a gallon. Is that still on the table, do you think? Well, it's still a low level possibility, especially in August. We've already seen some tropical disturbances that can affect refinery operations. Half of the nation's refining capacity is on the coast in Texas and Louisiana. So Mother Nature, uh, if we don't see her play nice, there still could be an impact, though I think the odds are rather low. It's something to watch for, especially in August, once we get into the peak of hurricane season. Yeah, it's certainly a good time to kind of look ahead to the rest of the year, Patrick, the second half of the year at least. You look at where oil prices have been trading. Um, you know, we're still seeing a lot of supply coming online from Russia, despite the cuts that we've heard from OPEC Plus, or at least Saudi Arabia. As we look to the second half of the year, I mean, where do you expect some of these prices to trend? Well, I think we could go a little bit lower. I think really a lot of the disappointment that has offset OPEC's production cuts has been China. Chinese demand has been very soft, very lackluster, even as their economy has reopened after COVID-19. And the thinking earlier this year was that China could have a tremendous reopening that could spark global consumption, but it really hasn't panned out yet. And I think the second half of the summer, especially as we get into the fall, we could eventually see the national average falling below $3 a gallon with the typical caveats. Again, hurricane season and refinery disruptions are the wild card. But once you get into October and November, we could see the national average making a run at that sub $3 a gallon level. Patrick, even though we are seeing prices declining, we are seeing states, some states taking action, trying to limit some of the very high prices that we saw just about a year ago. California has a new, a new law that they just passed aimed at stopping oil companies from what they say, inflating gas prices. I was taking a look at your Twitter account, and you were saying that this could potentially backfire. Why? Well, you know, a lot of politicians have demonized the oil sector as being the lone wolf as the reason for higher prices. But what a lot of Californians don't realize is the cost of regulations is extremely high. That's why California has almost always led the nation with the highest gas prices, because they have their own blend of fuel. They essentially tell refiners how to do it. Uh, in addition to having crop and trade and wildly high gasoline taxes. So it's going to sh shed light on how the industry works, but it also could shed light on how those regulations impact the price of gasoline. Yeah, I mean, looking at just how this would work in California, I mean, it specifically calls for oil companies to hand over additional information. It's not sort of just jumping on and saying, well, you know, we will decide who's actually price gouging. So ultimately, isn't that additional information a good thing? Yeah, the price transparency is certainly good, especially if people sit down and try to understand how it all works, especially if the government makes it clear how taxes and regulation impact those refining operations. So absolutely shining a light on it is not a bad thing. Uh, but again, will the government disclose that a lot of the burden on from high prices are from regulations in California? Uh, finally, Patrick, we're, we're noticing this, this banner here, Norton Shores, Michigan. What's going on behind you? Is that just close well, to home? Well, we've got a station. Yeah, it's, it's you know, I've, I've hit the road myself already making a jump start. Uh, the station in behind me here today, earlier today, was at 359. And since then, the station is now charging basically the national average. So the perfect example right behind me of a station that's about a dollar and 50 cents below a year ago uh, to kick off the July 4 weekend. Okay, certainly a good example there. Patrick DeHaan, guest buddy, head of petroleum analysis. Great to have you on today. Enjoy the long holiday weekend. Thanks for having me. Well, coming up, the Wall Street Journal now saying the Chinese balloon that passed over the U.S. earlier this year was intended for spying. We're going to speak to a cybersecurity expert on the other side after this short break.
U.S. antitrust regulators are planning to file another suit against Amazon targeting, targeting its core online marketplace. Bloomberg reporting this case will focus specifically on how Amazon rewards online merchants that use its logistics services and charge more for the ones that don't. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Alexis Keenan, who's following the very latest here. Uh, Alexis, what's the likelihood of this succeeding? <laughs> uh, if I could only read those tea leaves, Akiko, uh, this is just one of many suits, antitrust suits and others stacking up by the FTC against Amazon. As you mentioned, this time the FTC reportedly, according to Bloomberg, is planning to sue Am Amazon. This would be a fourth time, I believe it is. But it would be striking really at the heart of the company's e-commerce empire, Amazon.com. According to this report, the FTC plans to allege that the company is favoring the third party sellers over uh, those that don't use its uh, logistics services. And what Amazon does in its logistics services is it offers third party sellers to warehouse their products and also ship them as also they offer some customer service for them, taking a lot of the labor off of small businesses plate. Now, this is a big deal because third party sales now represent about half of Amazon's online sales for Amazon.com. Uh, this so-called favoritism is supposed to be the heart of the suit. Now, if they're sued, though, Amazon, it might not come as a huge surprise. Bloomberg says that the company received a note all the way back in 2019 notifying them that there was an investigation into these practices. Just last week, uh, guys, uh, Amazon was sued by the FTC with the FTC at th that point going after the practices around getting consumers to sign up for Amazon Prime. And then the FTC is saying that Amazon is also frustrating the ability to cancel those subscriptions. You also have an investigation into the uh, Amazon's acquisition of Roomba, uh, or rather the iRobot I maker of the Roomba vacuum. And then all on top of that, you have California going after the company as well, saying that they are uh, have some anti-competitive uh, contracting prices driving up uh, the prices of sales in those states. But so far, Amazon not commenting, though, on these reported details coming out today, guys. All these actions keeping you very busy, Alexis. Alexis Keenan is always staying on top of all those legal cases. Thanks so much for that. The Wall Street Journal reporting the Chinese spy balloon that passed over the U.S. earlier this year was full of American-made equipment. This coming amid the Biden administration's push to further limit China's access to U.S. technology. The U.S. is also reportedly considering new curbs on AI chips. Well, Huawei is one of the companies that's been impacted by the crackdown. The U.S. placed the Chinese company on a trade blacklist back in 2019. Here to discuss this and more, we want to bring in Andy Purdy, Huawei U.S. Chief Cybersecurity Officer. Andy, it's great to see you here. Thanks so much for coming in studio. So let's just start with what Huawei looks like today. So I just mentioned that 2019 date. Here we are in 2023. How has Huawei repositioned its business and what does the impact look like as you look ahead? Well, we've adjusted our business portfolios and invested heavily in research and development and innovation, working with partners. So we have managed to grow our enterprise business 30% as of 2022 over 2021. We've, we've, we've ended the decrease in our consumer business with the loss of our smartphone business, and we've leveled off with our carriers, so we're having steady growth consistent with our, our forecast. Um, Andy, you know, as Shauna pointed out, in many ways, Huawei has become the poster child for the U.S. crackdown on Chinese companies um, since 2019. And I wonder, since then, especially under this administration, we have seen this, this veil of national security uh, being a, a way to crack down on AI chips, cloud computing. In the case of Huawei, it was 5G technology. How do you as a Chinese company operate how does that shift your strategy when there's so much coming in from one of the largest markets? Well, we have managed, as, as I said to Shana, to adjust our portfolios. We've diversified our supply chain. We've invested heavily in R&D, uh, over 25% of our revenue last year. And we've partnered with thousands of companies, leveraging the connection that's grown between 5G and cloud and AI uh, and similar technologies. So we're working to help digitize, to help move toward the fourth industrial revolution, bringing to an intelligent world. And so we've been managing to create the use cases for 5G 
and 5G to business. And we're hoping to share with the United States what is working around the world, because my concern is, as an American is to make sure that America takes advantage of these financial opportunities that are they're going to change our way of life. And we'll talk a bit more about what Huawei is doing, at least that the new businesses you've entered. But there's a lot of Chinese companies that have now are now facing a similar pressure that Huawei faced back in 2019. What do you tell them in terms of how to pivot the business? Because at the end of the day, if you don't have access to U.S. technology, if you don't have access to know-how on something like chips, there's a question of how how do you know how reliant can you be? How self-reliant can you be? Well as lessons from our experience to really understand our customers work closely with our customers we formed 10 joint innovation centers uh, around the world um, the what the needs are and the capabilities are that can flow from this move to 5g enabled technologies this digitalization of industry sectors that can help move us toward not just the fourth industrial revolution but an intelligent world a sensing world and have pilots in different parts in the world and create use cases in different countries that we've been able to do with, with 5G to business. So then working with innovation to help the carriers create their capabilities that they can bring to their customers, creating the use cases for carriers to monetize what they do. This has helped us grow our business and this has helped us create and strengthen the ecosystem. And I think this is a good lesson for uh, other companies. In addition, we form freestanding business units, learning some of the lessons uh, from some of the literature uh, in the past. The Innovator's Dilemma is one book. Freestanding business units for roads and, and, uh, and cybersecurity and uh, business environment, cloud security, ports, mines, manufacturing. All these things, we've created freestanding business units that can move forward to grow their business in a way that makes the most sense for them, in addition to retaining the kind of businesses that we've had that have been successful in the past. So I think these are some good lessons. Uh, what does your footprint look like in other Western markets, particularly around Europe? Because the U.S. certainly isn't the only one that has been pressuring Huawei and raising concerns about national security. Well, the, the issues and the pressure have been going on, as you say, for, for a number of years. Uh, we are working to deal with those, but it's not so much us dealing with them directly because we are part of the supply chain. So we are enabling our customers to see the benefits of our technology and the cybersecurity and privacy requirements that we meet and others meet. Frankly, we're heartened that the Biden administration has said that they want to participate more in international standards. Because when you look at some of the recent cyber attacks, you can see there's no, no such thing as a trusted supplier. So we need to make sure that we raise the bar with standards, with transparency, and with in, independent third-party monitoring of everyone, because the bad guys can hack into everyone. As we become more dependent on these technologies, it's important to raise the bar for cybersecurity and privacy for everyone. And Andy, going off that, what is going to look like here in the future? I'm curious to get your perspective, because you have a unique perspective, an American working for a Chinese company. Just given the escalation in the tensions between the two companies, what do you think that relationship is going to, will likely look like in the coming months, given the fact that there has been some progress, but there's still tough tensions between the two? Well, let me say three things about the geopolitics. Uh, first, uh, I think it's important that the governments find common ground, informed by the private sector, because there now are talks, private talks between the private sectors in, in, in China and the U.S. with transparency and hopefully consistent with what Janet Yellen said, that we can't totally break the relationship between U.S. and China. It would be devastating for us. Second lesson from globalization is that we've got to make sure that America doesn't do things to hurt the bad guys, which in fact hurt Americans more. Uh, the cut off your nose to spite your face. And I'm talking about semiconductors, and you can see some of the comments by Micron, NVIDIA, the Semiconductor Industry Association, uh, et cetera. And we've got to make sure that we don't let geopolitics stand in the way of what's necessary for America to compete. And so we've got to learn the lessons of these, these stories today. We've got to learn those lessons, but we have to make sure we train our workforce a whole lot better than being trained in this country so that we have an ability to compete and bring the benefits of technology to all of our people. Uh, finally, Andy, one of the new areas of business that Huawei has ventured into is, is EVs. And I know you're not specifically building out the cars, but can you talk about just the, the, the opportunity that you see in the domestic market, the Chinese market? Uh, the fact that Huawei is getting in on EVs probably points to just how big the potential is. 
Well, the intelligent automotive solutions is, is a gigantic market in China uh, around the world. And in fact, when we talk about the digitalization of industries generally, the benefits that flow from artificial intelligence, such as in smart mining, smart ports, smart agriculture, et cetera, those benefits are really important. And that's going to help increase the efficiency of businesses. And it's significantly, it's going to reduce the carbon footprint. So we hope that America can learn some of these lessons and, and try to move forward in some of these areas. Andy Purdy, Huawei U.S. Chief Cybersecurity Officer. It's always good to talk to you. You're welcome. Apple is the world's biggest company by market cap, and it's heading for another milestone. The company on the cusp of reaching a $3 trillion market cap. Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery is here to break down but it's certainly been a long journey here for Apple to get to that $3 trillion. Yes, and we were here briefly once before, but right now the stock is trading at $189.37. It's going to need to close today's session at $190.74 to achieve that $3 trillion valuation. But let's back up and take a look at how Apple got here. First, Apple went public on December 12, 1980. 22 bucks a share. The value of the company was roughly $1 billion. Call it an early unicorn. Steve Jobs left, 19, left the company in 1985, and that was after a conflict with then-CEO John Scully. Two years later, in June of 87, we see the first of five stock splits. Jobs returned to the company in 1997, and Apple's financial future was looking bleak. But Dell founder Michael Dell reportedly spoke out at the time Apple's financials trouble, saying it should shut down and get the shareholders back their money. Of course, that did not happen. And in May 1998, Jobs introduced the first iMac. Apple's iMarket cap at the time was nearly $3.9 billion. Now, we get into the 2000s here, and when the iPod launched launch back in October of 2001, the company valued at nearly six and a half billion dollars. In 2006, Apple got a little payback from Michael Dell's comments about closing the company. On January 13th of that year, Apple's market cap surged to just over $72 billion, surpassing Dell's. When the iPhone was introduced a little more than a year later, the company surpassed $100 billion. Now, Steve Jobs left Apple again in 2011 due to health reasons and announced Tim Cook would replace him. Market cap when Cook to took over, it closed in on $350 billion, inching up there. On the innovation front, Apple fans were wondering what was the next big thing going to be under Cook's tenure? And on April, 20, uh, April 2015, they got to find out. This was the debut, the, the debut excuse me, of the Apple Watch. Apple's market cap at the time, $760 billion. Apple notched a $1 trillion valuation in August of 2018. And just under two years later, it doubled to $2 trillion. Apple nearly made it to $3 trillion in January of 2022. The stock hit that level on an intraday trading level, uh, but failed to close above it. So today, we find ourselves in a similar place, watching the valuation tick closer to $3 trillion. And uh, if we can get the Wi-Fi interactive up, I can give you a, a real-time view of what's going on with Apple here. If not, that's OK, too. I'm going to go back to the uh, NASDAQ here, and I'm going to show you how it compares to some of the other, to some of its peers in the technology sector. Now, this is a year-to-date performance up 45.7%. But check out the market cap when I apply this, and you can see just short of that number right there, pretty impressive as it trounces everything else on the board, guys. Just shy of that. Maybe we'll see it before the end of the week. All right, Jared Blickery, thanks. Well, coming up, we'll get you caught up with today's top movers as the markets get ready to close. You're looking at gains for the Dow and S&P. We'll be right back.
All right, and that wraps up today's trading day. Dow S&P holding on to gains financials. The top performing sector in today's trading action, Dow closing up just around 270 points. S&P up about half of a percent. The Nasdaq just, just below the flat line, essentially flat here for the day. Let's take a look at some of the individual movers. We got to start with shares of SVV. Savers Value Village going public today on Wall Street and a strong performance on the day. The stock price at 18 bucks a share closed just around 23 bucks a share, looking at a pop just about 28%. Nikiko, we heard from the CEO last hour talking about why this why this business makes a lot of sense, especially in a time like now. It's well positioned even to withstand a recession, but also a lot of the focus was on how this was going to perform and really gauging interest in IPOs at this point. I mean, that is a huge pop. Talk about who knew there would be so much excitement around a thrift store retailer? But th there's a number of tailwinds that the CEO did speak to. One is the one you just highlighted, Shauna, when you think about sort of the softer economy, those trying to maybe save on some money. I mean, this is kind of a play that, that you would expect would do quite well. But there's also this generational shift that we talked about, where we are seeing younger consumers who are a little more conscious of the footprint of what they buy going back to thrift stores and secondhand shopping, uh, certainly the company well positioned for that as well. So we'll see how it holds up, at least on the first day, a huge, huge pop for the company. Well, it was also a big day for Virgin Galactic, the company completing its first commercial space flight two years after it was originally planned. The stock initially jumped on the launch, but in the end, plunging more than 10 percent on the day. Uh, Sean, I, I guess you could argue that there's a bit profit taking happening here I mean, by the rumors, sell the news. I mean, this was kind of expected after many delays, but Virgin Galactic really needed this because this will jumpstart their commercial operations. Now we're talking about monthly trips here. Uh, the companies had had a lot of a lot of delays, a lot of stops, and there's there's a lot of money, a lot of ground they need to make up now. Yeah, certainly they have been faced with a number of delays. I agree with you with what you're saying just in terms of the stock action today, a sell the news type of event. I couldn't really find any other reason as to why we're looking at a loss of just about 10 percent today. You mentioned the fact that we've been waiting so long for this to happen. And put that in perspective, Virgin Galactic has a backlog of about 800 passengers Majority of those were sold at prices between 200000 250000 over a decade ago. And then, of course, they went on sale more recently for $450,000 a seat. They're they have very, very high ambitions in terms of what this is going to look like several years from now. Virgin Galactic envisions being a fleet large enough to accommodate 400 flights annually. So, yes, this is a massive step here for the company, but certainly they have a lot uh, lot more room uh, for growth here in order to attain some of those goals that they have laid out. We're also taking a look at Bitcoin today, getting a bump after Fidelity officially refiled its application for a spot Bitcoin ETF. And Akiko, we certainly have seen a lot of excitement surrounding a spot Bitcoin ETFs, even though we spoke to an expert not too long ago who said that he doesn't see any chance of something like this getting approved as long as President Biden is in the White House. But of course, they follow in the footsteps of two weeks ago, BlackRock filed for their spot Bitcoin ETF. So certainly excitement, whether or not we'll see approval, that's another question. Yeah, Sean, I keep going back to those comments from our guest last <laughs> week who said, absolutely not. It is not happening under this administration, at least that was his thinking. But again, you know, you could certainly argue that Fidelity, just, just another player here, looking to position itself uh, in the anticipation at some point there will be a spot Bitcoin ETF. And look, I mean, it's any kind of confidence, at least beyond the current environment right now for Bitcoin, uh, certainly going to get investors back on board. Certainly is. And Bitcoin just above 30,000. All right. Well, markets closing the day mostly higher as we got a better than expected GDP revision. And there was also some optimism after the banks passed their Fed's stress test yesterday. But as we wrap up the quarter and the first half of the year, where should you consider investing going forward? Joining us now is Brent Schutte, Northwestern Mutual Wealth Management Company Chief Investment Officer. Brent, it's great to see you again. So what do you think that second half of the year, what that's going to look like? Yeah, unfortunately, I think it's going to be a bit tougher than the first half of the year. And so you've seen the market do well based upon the economy not yet falling into recession, but inflation coming down. 
We continue to believe, much as we forecast, that inflation will come down, but we do think you're likely to have a recession given all the tightening that's still in the system. And the reality that even with that inflation coming down, the Federal Reserve is likely to tighten until they see the labor market weaken. They're really, really afraid of a wage price spiral. So I think current CPI is tied to COVID. That's coming off the boil. But the Fed is worried that in, uh, that wages continue to rise because the labor market's too tight. And that's why they're going to continue to hike until they see the jobless numbers move somewhere below 100,000, if not into the negative area. Uh, so, Brent, we had a guest on Kevin Mon earlier today who said that he thinks that this threat or this rhetoric coming from the Fed chair about two additional hikes is just that rhetoric that trying to job on the market a bit. But it sounds like you're in the camp that there will be additional hikes and you're positioning your portfolio appropriately. There will be additional hikes. I mean, this is a very uh, dependent upon uh, one thing. What does the labor market do? To me, that's what the Fed's worried about. If you think about every comment about 60s and 70s and 80s, it was a wage price spiral. And right now, the jobs market, the Fed believes, is too strong. There's too much demand for workers and not enough supply. And in that case, wages would rise, which could take inflation, which is now falling, and pull it higher more permanently. That's why I think it's dependent upon the jobs market. But certainly, uh, Wall Street is still looking for 200,000 jobs being created next week. Uh, that's too strong for the Fed. And if that is the case, they will hike again at their next meeting. So, Brent, do you think we could see more than two hikes, two more, three more hikes on the table here from the Fed? Again, it comes back to when the labor market cracks. I think you're starting to see signs of the labor market cracking. Um, you're starting to see jobless claims. I know this week we're down a bit because of the holiday, but the jobless claims are, are, are ticking higher. Certainly some parts are showing the labor market's weakening a bit. Um, but uh, to me, it's a question of when it, it happens. And I, I think it happens in the back half of the year, which is why I think you'll have a recession then. Um, so, I mean, this is a, a data dependent Fed. If you think about last year, I mean, they started the year forecasting 75 basis points in total of hikes, and they did it four times 75 basis points. Uh, and so they are certainly reactive to the data. And to me, the one area they're still worried about is that labor market. So, Brent, let's talk about your investment thesis right now. Underweight large caps, overweight small and medium cap. Why? Because of valuation and because I think small and mid caps at their current levels of valuation have discounted what I think will be a mild recession. And so typically small and mid caps don't do well during a recession because it's an economic headwind. But I think at 13 times earnings that have been marked down 15, 16% already, I think you've already discounted some of that. And I think this is an area that investors can overweight for the coming one, two, three year time period. And so I'm not gonna try to get too cute around timing that recession. Uh, and so that's the part of the market that I think will have the economy eventually become a tailwind and you have really cheap valuations. And I think this is an area of the market that could outperform for the next few years. And that's why we wanna overweight that relative to large caps, which are expensive based upon uh, basically any historical metric. Uh, and that's why we're, we're focused more on that part of the market right now. Brent, what about the bond market? Are you seeing opportunity there? Yeah, so we are overweight fixed income. So um, we, and that's the first time we've been overweight fixed income in years. We started overweighting it towards the end of last year when rates went last year. You started the year at 175. By October, on investment grade bonds, you were over 5%. And so if you think about this in my comments about inflation and our forecast for inflation to continue, continue moving lower, at 5%, you have real return again. And today, that bond market still yields four and three quarters. Uh, and so that's an area of the market that I think for the first time in you know, three, four, five years uh, is attractive. And we want to be overweight that, especially given the reality that we do believe the back half of the year could be a bit more choppy, uh, given what we believe will ultimately be a recession. The market will have to sort of price that in at some point. So what does that bond to equities ratio look like in your portfolio? I mean, we keep hearing that 60-40 is no longer. No, the 60-40 has actually been strengthened. If you think about the 60-40 over the past few years, the 40% basically yielded nothing. And what you buy a bond for is typically what you get. Uh, and so now with that bond ratio, with that bond allocate or that bond yield somewhere around 5%, that's going to be a better part of your portfolio pushing forward from a return standpoint. Uh, and I don't think it's ever been dead, but we do think that a lot of people just believe it's the S&P 500. And if you tie my earlier comments into that, we think it should be expanded to include things like mid and small caps uh, and a little bit more of a weighting. And so we're, we're, we're um, you know, we never tilt too far away from home base or home kind of allocation, uh, but we are overweight fixed income relative to equities and commodities. Brent, always good to get your takes there. Uh, CIO of Northwestern Mutual, Brent Schutte, thanks so much for joining us today. 
Thank you. Well, coming up, Nike shares closing the day up just slightly. They're set to release earnings results. We're going to break down those numbers on the other side of the break. We'll be right back. The first forecast is in for the potential swing states in the 2024 presidential election. This time around, it comes down to just four. Here with the details is Yahoo Finance's senior columnist, Rick Newman. So, Rick, what's the shift that we've seen since 2020? Yeah, I, 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 my uh, ears and eyes, eyes and ears perk up when I see election forecasts for 2024. So this is from the uh, Center for Politics at the U University of Virginia, a prominent forecaster. Uh, and they're saying they think it's going to come down to four states uh, in 2024 that are going to basically decide the election, uh, Georgia, Wisconsin, Arizona, and Nevada. Um, now, we've seen some shifts in recent election cycles over what actually constitute uh, swing states in the United States. Uh, Georgia, did, for example, did not used to be considered a swing state, but Biden did win uh, Georgia in 2020, and uh, we also got a flip from two Republican senators to two Democratic senators in Georgia. So uh, Georgia, interestingly, now in the swing state category. Uh, a couple others that people might think of as traditional swing states, not so much anymore. I mean, there used to be a, a saying, uh, as goes Ohio, so goes the nation. Not really true anymore. Ohio has drifted to the right. It's considered a pretty safe Republican state. Even Florida used to be considered a swing state. Uh, that has also drifted to the right. And the uh, University of Virginia forecasters are not putting Pennsylvania in that swing state category either. They're saying uh, Pennsylvania leans Democratic. Uh, that's for a variety of reasons. 
Uh, Democrats did have a very good year in Pennsylvania in 2022. They flipped the Senate seat and uh, they also won the governorship in a tight race. So Democrats have some momentum there. All the usual caveats apply. It's very early and many things could change. Georgia and Arizona. I mean, those are the two states that we saw as flips back in 2020. Yep. What are the prospects for the president right now in those states? Uh, you know what? It's going to come down to the economy as it often does. Now, that's barring any kind of, uh, you know, major surprise, such as a health issue for President Biden, uh, a terrorist attack, a war, all the things that can um, throw politics into turmoil. But um, the best rule of thumb for predicting the outcome of an election when an incumbent president is running for re-election, believe it or not, it's not the president's age, it's not the president's gaffes or his stumbles, it's how well the economy is doing in the second quarter uh, of the election year and then in the third quarter leading straight into the uh, election itself. So when GDP growth looks pretty good um, in the second quarter of an election year, let's say 2% or better, um, that is great for an incumbent president. That is usually good enough to get the president over the threshold. Um, a recession would perhaps have the opposite effect. Things have be been a little bit different uh, in the last couple of years, obviously, because of inflation. So we have had economic growth. We have GDP growth now, but consumers are pretty gloomy and Biden's approval rating is pretty low, largely because of inflation. So the sort of um, best case scenario for Biden, or at least a plausible scenario, I think, is inflation cools down. And we still have economic growth this time next year would be really good news for Biden, assuming his health holds up uh, and uh, nothing nothing else surprising happens. Yeah, we did hear from his chief economic advisor, Lael Brainer, today saying she expects inflation to come down to 2 percent by November 2024, magically during the election. But, you know, you just made up the point about the economy. And that still begs the question about who actually gets credit for a stronger economy. You look at a state like Georgia, I mean, they've done relatively well when you think about the, the national picture. Does the governor get the credit or do you think voters still connect that directly to the White House? I mean, the president typically gets the credit or the blame for what happens in the economy, um, whether the president deserves it or not. Um, and Biden must feel uh, pretty confuzzled that his that his approval rating is still down around 40 percent. That's low. Uh, you know, to have a good re good shot at reelection, he would want that to be much closer to 50 percent, the high 40s at a minimum. Um, but the reason is pretty clear. It's just inflation. Um, and even though inflation has dropped from a, a high of 9% last year to 4% this year, uh, number one, I think consumers are shell-shocked by some of the price increases they've seen. And number two, um, we're not, we don't have deflation. So the price increases that we've seen during the last two years are still there. We've, got, we've now got the annualized rate of price increases um, you know, close to under control, but we're not going back to the lower prices we had two years ago. So um, incomes have been falling behind inflation uh, until just the last month. Only in the last month did we see a real income growth for the first time in two years. Now, if we can see that sustained for a year, I think consumers will start to feel better about Biden, and that'll improve his odds. Of course, the big question is we're going to have whether we're going to have this recession that everybody keeps talking about, but keeps not showing up. Still the big question there. Rick Newman, as always, thanks so much for that. Bye, guys. Well, we are watching shares of Nike now under pressure in after hours on the back of their results. Uh, Shauna, what are we looking at? Yeah, Kiko, an interesting report here. Shares off almost 2% on this report. Revenue coming in better than expected, $12.83 billion. Estimate was for 12 0.59 billion. That's up 4% on a year over year basis. It looks like EPS was a slight miss coming in 66 cents. The estimate on the street was for 67 cents. So a mixed report there on the top and bottom line. But digging into these numbers, we know inventory was a focal point in this report, essentially flat on a year over year basis, $8.45 billion. The estimate was for 8.88 billion. It's up four tenths of a percent. So essentially flat from where it was a year ago. Gross margin essentially in line with expectations. China revenue, another focal point in this report, up 16% from a year ago, 1.81 billion. That beat the street's expectations. And direct sales up 15% to five and a half billion. So we're jumping around a little bit here in extended trading off just about a half of a percent right now. But on the inventory side of things, 
Akiko, flat on a year-over-year -year basis. We know that's something that analysts are paying very, very close attention to. Yeah, the, the recovery on the Chinese market, at, at least one positive for Nike, but there's still going to be questions around the softness that they have seen in the North American market. We've heard from wholesale partners like Foot Locker talking about some of the demand that they have seen pulling back, especially on sportswear. So going to be interesting to hear what we what we hear from the company, uh, particularly around that, too. Yeah, certainly. And digging into some of these other numbers here, brand digital sales, they were up 14 percent. Uh, when you take a look at North America, EBITDA, that was $1.39 billion. That was off 6% on a year-over-year -year basis. So China sales better than expected. But like you were saying, just in terms of what that picture looks like, certainly a question analysts are asking right now. All right, well, coming up, we will take a deeper dive into Nike's results. We'll be right back. Shares of Nike off just about a tenth of a percent after reporting its earnings results. Let's dive into this report again. It was a beat on the top line, miss on the bottom line. Inventory levels flat from where they were a year ago. With Brian Nagel, Oppenheimer Managing Director and Senior Analyst. Brian, it's great to see you here. So just your first take on these results. Well, nice to see you as well. Look, I think it's a pretty solid report. I mean, there's obviously a lot of moving pieces here. You know, hit the tape just a a few minutes ago, so we're, we're digging through it now. But you know, something, I, I, uh, some some key points that stand out to me. It looks like you know, across the board, sales growth was was, was solid. Uh, you know, really both in the United States as well as elsewhere. You know, nice. It seems like there was some nice sales growth in China. That's been a big focal point for um, us as investors. And then also another big focal point: inventories. If I'm if I'm looking at this uh, correctly, it's uh, inventories year and year are flat. 
you know, so that 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 suggests some real significant progress on the part of Nike to manage better inventory. So, look, I think it's a pretty solid report. We'll obviously have the conference call here at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern. You know, on that report, the, the management team will give more color on these results and then likely give some type of guidance for the next fiscal year. And I think that's going to be very important to determine how the stock trades either tonight or tomorrow morning. Uh, let's start with what we saw overseas, the number you just highlighted in terms of the bounce back they saw in China. What does that suggest in terms of how much the sales could accelerate going into the second half of the year? Because the concern has been that the pickup after China reopened has not been as significant as initially expected. Yeah, look, it's, I mean, it's, it's difficult to determine that, you know, just looking at these results. But what we can say is, if you look at what Nike reported just a few moments ago, and put that together with what the company said on its uh, fiscal third quarter call, you know, say three months ago. Okay, we, it seems like there's a nice progression here. You know, a weak December, you know, when COVID was still very much an issue in, in China. And then we started to have a rebound January and February when some of the COVID restrictions were lifted. And then we get this number here, you know, in the, the May quarter. So again, we have to piece this all together. But I think, you know, the bottom line is we're seeing a nice progression forward in sales growth in China. Now, where that could ultimately be, you know, if, if things get going again, I mean, 16% is light, right? But I think directionally it's where the market wants to see it. Brian, what do you think this tells us about the underlying trends? Because going into this report, there was some concern just about the wholesale business, especially what uh, on the heels of the numbers that we got out from Foot Locker. Is this reassuring the street, do you think, or does this reassure you just in terms of Nike's positioning there? No, absolutely. And again, I, you know, I want to, we're going to get that conference call here just in a short while. I think we'll get a lot more color, a lot more contextualization on these numbers. But I mean, to answer your question, you know, sim rather simplistically, yes. You know, I think, you know, I've been telling, we, I've been, my team and I have been talking a lot about Fort Locker. We don't cover Fort Locker officially, but we obviously keep a very close eye on it. We do cover names like Dick's Sporting Goods and Academy Sports. And the, the point we've been making to our clients is, is that we think Fort Locker's issues are largely Fort Locker's issues. You know, I think Nike's actually performing well here. We've heard from some of these other retailers that sell Nike products that, in their view, Nike's performing well as well. So, but to answer your question, yeah, I mean, what we're seeing right now is reassuring that the Nike brand is intact, that the consumer is reacting to this brand positively. Brian, what's your number one question going into the conference call? Sustainability. I mean, we're kind of where we're going from here. You know, so to the extent that. Nike gives us guidance in, into the next fiscal year, which will be the May 24 year. You know, that's going to be really key. Kind of where do we go from here? You know, what do you see, Nike? What do you see in terms of consumer reaction? You know, where, the inventory seems to be clean. Where's the promotional environment? It, it's more kind of where do we go from here is really the big question. Brian, it seems like at least from these numbers that Nike has a much better handle on inventory, a critical point here in this report. What do you think this tells us just about the promotional activity, the fact that they maybe won't have to rely on it nearly as much as they have in recent quarters? Yeah, look, you know, if I, if I step back, and I, so I, I've covered you know, the broader athleisure space, obviously with Nike, Lululemon, and some of the retailers. I mean, there was a lot of concern two, three quarters ago about these bloated inventories, right? And, and, and the, the basic thinking was that as the supply chain led up, opened, there was a lot of product made its way to the United States and kind of in, in, in quick succession. There's a lot of product here, right? And so these, these retailers and brands had to work through it. I would say, again, stepping back and looking at Nike's results from a few minutes ago, these companies have done a phenomenal job of managing this inventory. You know, and I, I think that the inventory, you know, for the most part, you know, the, the inventory debacle that Wall Street and investors were worried about really didn't happen. You know, where I think you're seeing a normalization in promotional trends post-COVID. Okay, now there's more product, but I, I think we're, we're really past that that point of that these these inventories in and of themselves are going to, are, are going to spur significant promotions and impact gross margins significantly from here. So, Brian, you connect the numbers that we got out just a moment ago with those from the likes of Lulu. Um, what does that tell you about the relative strength or, or maybe some weakness in the athleisure space, especially in the face of a software economy? I, that's a great question. In my mind, what I'm seeing right now is athleisure is holding up well. You know, if you go back to the Lululemon report from, I guess, a couple of weeks ago or so, you know, there, I mean, that was, that was kind of the report you look at and say, what recession? You know, those results across the board were strong. So, you know, Nike, bigger company, doesn't put up the type of growth rates that Lululemon puts up. But again, look at these results. They're not that. This is not suggestive. If I look at you know the, the Nike results we saw just a few minutes ago, 
they're not suggestive of a recession or a consumer pullback in the United States. I mean, of course, within those numbers, there might be pockets of softness, points of weakness, whatever. But in aggregate, we're not seeing it. So to answer your question, look, I think athleisure is performing quite well here. I think that speaks to underlying strength in the consumer. All right, Nike shows essentially flat here in extended trading. We'll get the earnings call in just about a half an hour from now. Brian Nagel of Oppenheimer, thanks. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, coming up, we are checking in on some of the top trending stories of the day as we go around the horn. Josh Schaefer, Alexander Canal are standing by. Guys, what do we have on tap? Well, Shana, if you haven't noticed, one of our favorite condiments, sriracha, is in short supply, and that means consumers are spending a heck of a lot more money. And it might be more than you think, too. We're talking triple digits. We're going to break down how much it's costing for that hot sauce next. The U.S. is considering new restrictions on AI chip shipments to China, according to a report from the Wall Street Journal. This as concerns mount over the possible threat of an advanced AI in the hands of U.S. rivals. Shipments to China from chipmakers like NVIDIA could be blocked by the Commerce Department as early as next month. Chipmaker shares falling pre-market on the report. I think this is where the rubber meets the road, and I think AI is a great story. I think it's hard to argue against the fact that it could change the world. But these bumps happen when we're talking about new technologies, and this is a very new trend. So I would tell investors that, you know, this is kind of part of the process. This is the world figuring out where AI fits, and there are going to be ups and downs. 
this group has had an unbelievable run, and, and, and whether it be the AI stocks in general or the chip stocks uh, in particular as well. So it'll be interesting, not only this week, but as we move into next week, a lot of these institutions, they might start to pull back a little bit because of this concern. Because there's concern about whether the Biden administration is going to put any restrictions on the ability of these companies to export their goods, then those valuation levels could come in. There's plenty of profits to take off the table. Might an air pocket be coming if that's the direction the Biden administration wants to go? Certainly, that's something you can't rule out. I spoke to one strategist over at Baird, Ted Mortensen, who basically said that this is turning out to look like into almost a geopolitical economic warfare issue. When you are restricting the exportation of these chips, you are basically trying to restrict economic growth in one country, and you're also trying to restrict their military advancements. This is going to be sort of a red line when it comes to uh, China in trying to restrict this. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. Josh Schaefer here with Alexandra Canal and Shauna Smith. We're talking about some of our favorite trending stories from the day. And I want to start with Snapchat, guys. Interesting to see what they're doing with paid subscribers right now. So it's been a year since Snapchat came out with Snapchat Plus, paid subscriber network that they have. And they've now reached over 4 million subscribers that are paying $4 a month for Snapchat Plus. Personally, I was kind of surprised to see it, to be honest, because I, I don't know how often you guys use Snapchat. I use it a little bit. I certainly have never considered the plus option, but it seems like something when you overall, when you think about the business, when you think about Snapchat trying to get revenue outside of just ads, to be able to pick up 4 million paid subscribers and start to build out that network a little bit, Sean, is certainly important for where the company is headed. It's very important. That's interesting that you were impressed by that number because when you put it in perspective, their daily active users, 375 million. So they were only able to convince 4 million of those users yeah. that it was worth mm -hmm. spending $3.99 a month. And $3.99 a month, when you compare it to many of the other subscriptions that are out there, what you're playing on a monthly basis is cheaper. But I think the real problem is what you get with that subscription. Yes. It's not enough. It's you not don't enough really to get anything. You don't get much. Experimental features. I was going to say, yeah. yeah, what is it? Like up to 20 different filter options, I believe, that are exclusive yeah. to those who use Snapchat Plus. But I think it's also just indicative of what's going on within that industry, right? Mm -hmm. When you take a look at the other social media giants, what they're doing, relying more on subscriptions to increase their revenue. Mm -hmm. Snapchat making a go at it. I don't think it was the best attempt, but I think they can build on it. Right. Yeah, totally. And look, I do think there is interest in Snapchat as a, as a social media platform. I use it only with a certain group of friends. <laughs> we just send pictures to each yeah. other back and forth. Well, they even use it for testing. Like texting. texting. Yeah, the younger, younger generation. generation. Younger yes. than me, though, too. So that's like college age and like high school, I think, is like mm -hmm. where that's most popular, I've found. Mm -hmm. So that's like even, we're talking like early, early. And then those kids maybe aren't necessarily paying yet to be subscribers either. I think yeah. that's an interesting part when you think about this as well. True. When you're demographic. If you're a younger consumer, you probably don't want to pay for anything that you use. Right, unless you have your parents paying right. for it. But when you start talking about someone that's probably like 21 or younger using the service, I think it's interesting to think about, you know, if they stay with it, if they are still texting on Snapchat and using it as constant communication in five years when they become someone that subscribes to more services, maybe that helps it out. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure, but I do agree right now, I don't care about getting more filters. I don't care about pinning my best friend on Snapchat. It's not really. To me, but the whole issue with Snap, and I, I don't use it, so obviously mm -hmm. this opinion it, it does not weigh <laughs> or doesn't really hold much weight, I should say. But my problem is, is that there's not enough to entice you to use it on a daily basis in terms of all sure. the other social media mm -hmm. platforms that are out there right now. What you are using, where you're giving up Snap at least the time I would potentially allocate to Snap to what else is out there. They're not being innovative enough in order to really expand their daily active users, which is so critical to grow the business, which is why one of the many reasons why the stock is still well off, over 80% off the highs that we saw not too long ago. Mm -hmm. and, and I think your point is valid. You need other people to use it yeah. in order for you to use it. And that is a really important factor there. Yeah, on the year, it's off about 16%. I believe it's up year to date, but still compared to where it was, it's just really gone downhill. And you know, all of us were not subscribed to Snapchat Plus, but some of us probably are subscribed to Disney Plus, which brings me to my story. I'm looking at shares at Disney. They're pretty flat today following a downgrade earlier this morning 
from KeyBank Capital. Now, KeyBank downgraded the stock, citing five areas of concern. And I want to focus in on one of those, being ESPN. Uh, KeyBank saying that it's going to be materially harder for Disney to convert ESPN to a fully over-the-top streaming service because not a lot of people are going to want to pay the high price for that subscription. Uh, KeyBank saying that they did a survey for consumer interest. About 25% said that they would not be willing to pay at all for a pure sports streaming service. 46% said they would be willing to pay $10 or less a month. And then only 26% would pay $20 or more. But here's a problem here, guys, is that uh, sports, they Disney allocates about 30% of its $30 billion budget to sports. So KeyBank said that they really need to break even with 25 million subscribers at 33 bucks a month. And given that data, that ARPU number doesn't really seem likely. I, here's the thing. I think people can't really get there when they're doing that survey right now because their favorite team isn't behind a paywall. Mm -hmm. If you get to a point where ESPN actually put all of live sports behind a paywall, like there's a lot of people. I think there might be 25 million people that would pay $30 for that. If they have every NBA game, they have, mo they have a lot of NBA games. I mean, Turner Broadcasting has them too, but they have a lot of NBA games. They have some NBA playoff games. People are gonna pay for that. They have the NHL. People are gonna pay for that. Now, of course, Disney is paying a lot of money mm -hmm. for those deals, but I think if you start putting real live sports that people actually watch, not ESPN3, a college football team that I might watch, but I watch a lot of college football. When you start putting really popular things behind the paywall, I think sentiment would change. Well, and also just take a step back and you're a massive sports <laughs> fan, how expensive it could potentially be to be a sports fan, right? Because right. if you're paying, if it ends up being 30 bucks a month here for ESPN, for that streaming service, and you're also paying for Prime because you want to see the Thursday night football games, and you're also paying for Apple because they have baseball and soccer, it's going to start adding up. So I think that is a barrier here for ESPN to be able to charge 30 bucks, maybe they could get away with 20 bucks and then they would be able to significantly increase their subscriber numbers given the fact that maybe it's not going to be available on cable. But I think that this is just interesting in terms of what the roadmap looks like for Disney ahead because it really complicates what exactly Iger has said. And he has said that he does see mm -hmm. ESPN turning to fully fully accessible on streaming, but how they get there in a profitable way that makes sense given all the costs that they're putting into this really complicates all that matter. And it should have something to do with contracts too, right? Because I'd imagine a lot of the contracts would currently have to change because right oh, now yeah. I don't think they can put some of that stuff on streaming. Mm -hmm. So then it would take a couple years before we even kind of get to this point. But it is a good point of like, who creates the bundle again? You kind of just want a sports bundle again, yeah. right? Yeah. Realistically. I, I think of how much YouTube TV costs. And I know YouTube TV, it's sort of a cable replacement. It doesn't yeah. just have sports. I watch Bravo on YouTube TV. So I don't have it solely for sports. I share it with my family. I know my brothers use it primarily for sports. They charge a little less than 75 bucks a month. So maybe you could argue that 30 bucks isn't that bad for consumers if you have the majority of sports in that one service, I think eventually people are going to want to just go to one place to watch all their sports. How we get there, when we get there, I'm not sure. Clearly right now it's very fragmented, but eventually I think we're going to see a lot we of should create cable networks. Yeah, yeah right? Nice. This is where we're going yeah. back to the cable bundles. So. I'll never, I'll never right. have one of those. That'd be cool. <laughs> I, I do. I mean, you pay a heck of a lot and then add on <laughs> and all then those And then you have services. all the services. You're That's paying the way too much. It's way beyond our budget. All right, guys, I also want to talk about a story that I'm following. And it's kind of sad news for people out there who are Sriracha fans. And I'm sure if you are, then you are very <laughs> in tune with what is going on right now. But this shortage, it is going on, it's been going on for quite some time, over a year. It's still with us today, but why we're talking about it is just how much people are paying to get their hands on a bottle of Sriracha. It was written up that it was what? People are selling it for 70 bucks on eBay, over 100 bucks on Amazon. Really speaks to one, the demand out there, but two, the fact that this has been an issue for far too long for so many of those people. I'm kind of obsessed with the secondary market concept yeah. of it. Yeah. Like, I love that people see shortage headlines or people you can't get x product now and like mm -hmm. people's move is to go online and buy a ton of it and then try and sell it to people i think it's so funny that this has become like a thing now that is so popular with amazon and those third-party sellers right. that you don't realize it's just, is easy. yeah it's just another yeah. person selling it to you someone else mm -hmm. was just smarter they bought something you wanted and I now they're trading that. it to you at a high premium right I it's like that fun sometimes at amazon business. like you kind of need to do your shop 
shopping a little bit yeah. on Amazon to make sure you're getting the best deals because that could happen. But just to put this all in perspective, a 17 ounce bottle of Sriracha is around five bucks. So the fact that people are paying $100, $200. It is good sauce though. Is like there this, a, this is specific there a sriracha is good? Is there something else? Like I feel like yeah, this is a good moment for like a chef sauce. to come out. Oh, yeah, and yeah, very hot sauce doesn't to me. That doesn't taste like sriracha. I, I sriracha think is a little bit more I would of a much rather, to it. I would much rather suck it up and just eat Frank's Red Hot Sauce <laughs> than pay 70 bucks for a bottle of sriracha. It doesn't taste that different. I agree. I agree. <laughs> I agree. I'm, not, I'm not going out and buying it. Yep. But. but it's also interesting just how this is affecting restaurants too, right? Yeah. So many restaurants that do have sriracha bottles on their tables are actually oh, yeah. keeping a very, very close eye on it because they've started to notice theft of these sriracha bottles. There was one so restaurant funny. that said that they started the year with over 300 bottles. Right now, they're down to 100 just because so many customers are stealing them given the shortage. Can you imagine going to a restaurant and like having your kids like look out for people and just putting your sriracha bottle no, in I your have purse? taken a cup from a restaurant one time. <laughs> <laughs> I really like the design. Shrink in restaurants. So It'll be the story. Not beyond the story of first, first No, but it, it is just amazing when you take a just the secondary market and how yeah. much people are mm -hmm. trying to charge. And there must be a buyer out there somewhere that's willing to pay maybe not 70 bucks for a bottle, but willing to pay I a heck of a lot more than five bucks. I see some people did buy the $70 ones. Really? Like, I think, I think one of the eBay ones, that was an actual Sold. receipt <laughs> that someone bought. Wow. But some the 120 I haven't seen the 120 go yet. This is, yeah. I'll be spending my holiday weekend following this market. <laughs> Top story of the, of the year. Hopefully, yeah, yes. hopefully we'll see uh, the shortage end very soon. All right, guys, we got to leave it there for our roundtable discussion. But coming up, we're talking a little bit more about Nike. Nike shares on the move in extended trading following their earnings release. They beat on the top line, missed on the bottom. More on that when we come back.
unforeseen things. I've been tortured with voodoo. I've been shot nine times, including once by your father. Ah, sorry. But I've been looking for this all my life. And there you have it, Harrison Ford reprising his role as Indiana Jones in the fifth movie of the series. That hits theaters tomorrow. Here to talk about the summer box office is Paul DeGarabedi and Comscore senior media analyst. We've also got Yahoo Finance's Ali Canal joining in on the conversation. Uh, Paul, can we talk about how Harrison Ford hasn't really aged that much? He looks pretty good in that movie. Um, is this going to be amazing. the top gun that we saw last year? Is he going to find the same kind of success at the box office? Well, you know, it was a different marketplace a year ago. Top Gun Maverick really had a wide open playing field, a great movie, obviously. But there are actually 20 more wide release films this summer than last summer. So it's much more competitive in terms of that marketplace for movies. And we've seen this over the past few weeks. You know, we saw The Flash and Elemental opened, both underperforming a bit. And then this past weekend, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse returning to the top spot as No Hard Feelings, the Jennifer Lawrence comedy opened. So this, and now we have Indiana Jones for Fourth of July weekend, perfect timing for that movie. But then on the way is Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part One, Barbie, Oppenheimer, and the list goes on and on. Paul, you mentioned two films that did underperform, The Flash and Elemental. How much more pressure does it put on the rest of the summer slate? Great question. It absolutely puts more pressure on. And The Flash, you know, that one was so highly anticipated, but there were a lot of headwinds there for that movie. But I like to look at the second weekend performance of these movies. So if you look at Elemental and The Flash, both came under scrutiny in their opening weekends. In their second weekend, The Flash dropped around 72 or 73% from that opening weekend. Elemental dropped only 38% almost took the top spot, but Spider-Man Across Spider-Verse getting great reviews, audiences love it. In its fourth weekend, that film came back to the number one spot. It shows you how dynamic, dynamic and exciting and unpredictable this summer movie season is right now. And it's interesting too, because two genres, animation, superhero films, they typically have delivered massive results at the box office, but recently right. that seems to be lagging a bit. So what do you think is going on right now in the market and what's missing there for consumers? Well, you know, I don't think it's a mandate against a particular genre, because if, you know, if for every Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, you have Guardians of the Galaxy and Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse. As far as animated films, uh, Super Mario Brothers, Puss in Boots did tremendous business, and yet Elemental was the second lowest opening weekend ever for Pixar unadjusted for inflation. So now we're gonna have Indiana Jones, and this is obviously a franchise that is iconic, a character that's iconic. I think for the three days, we're looking at 60 or 65 million, but let, then we need to look at that second weekend and reviews matter to an extent. And you know, out, coming out of the Cannes Film Festival, people kind of lukewarm on the movie, but the true movie fans who just wanna go to the movie theater over 4th of July, beat the heat, go into the air-conditioned environment of a movie theater and see Indiana Jones. That's incredibly appealing, I think. Which film that's set to be released this summer do you think can reach those levels that we saw with Top Gun Maverick? Or do we not well, have that this summer? <laughs> maybe ask Tom Cruise because Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning. I mean, if you look at, and I, the movie has been seen by people in pre-release screenings and at conventions, uh, movie conventions and places like that. And I'm hearing that movie just absolutely delivers. Tom Cruise is, I mean, he is so important to the movie theater and to have Top Gun Maverick as a perfect warm up just a year later uh, for Mission Impossible uh, is just incredible. So that's the one I'm really looking out for. But the Barbie Oppenheimer weekend is the one I'm really intrigued by. We're going to see how many people are going to go see both of those movies, both kind of mid-century uh, icons and situations with Oppenheimer and Barbie. So very, very interesting weekend. I think that that's a weekend that kind of is emblematic of what's going on in the box office right now. Unpredictability, a crowded marketplace, very dynamic, 
hits and flops, that means, guess what? We're back to normal at the box office. Uh, Paul, finally, I know you've been following the WGA strike really closely. Uh, so much of yeah. the impact of that has really been focused on the TV side of things. But as yeah. the longer this drags on, what do you see as the impact to the film well, side? And are we likely yeah. to see that pipeline start to back up? You make a great point. That's exactly what's going to happen. Without the written, the word on the written page and the scripts, you can't make a movie. I mean, the movies do not write themselves. And this is really a situation that, you know, will, like you said, it's not impacting now. The movies that are in theaters now were written a lot, well, well before the strike, but eventually that pipeline is going to dry up. You've got to have new scripts. So hopefully that gets resolved sooner than later because the box office right now is definitely on a roll, even though some movies have performed better than expected or less than expected, but still for the overall marketplace, the year to date is up 21% over last year. So we wanna keep that going, that momentum going, but definitely the strike, very important. That's top of mind for everyone and everyone involved, hope it gets resolved. Yeah, two months and counting so far. Paul yeah. Zagarabedian with Comscore. <laughs> Good to talk to you today. And our thanks to Ali Canal as well. Thank you. Jana. All right, Akiko, let's take a look at Nike. We were talking about their earnings earlier in the hour. Right now, we're looking at extended trading off just about 4%. So a further move here to the downside on the heels of what, at least at the first glance of it, ahead of the earnings call, looks like a pretty decent report. Revenue coming in better than expected. When you take into account China sales, they were up... 16% from a year ago, topping what the street was looking for. Inventory was also better than expected, essentially flat from year ago levels. We know that was a key point in this report. Direct sales were up 15% to five and a half billion. The company though did post a slight miss on the bottom line, just by a penny. That might be one of the reasons, that is one of the reasons why we're looking at some downward pressure in this stock ahead of that earnings call tonight. Over the last three months, we're looking at losses of just about 6% year to date. The stock is also in the red off about 3%. When you take a look at that one year chart, just in the green, up about 9%. So certainly a laggard here when you take into account the movement that we have seen in the broader market since the start of the year. So again, that, er that earnings call getting set to get underway in just a few minutes from now. But ahead of that, Nike shares off about 3.5%. Well, it's closing time here at Yahoo Finance. Here's a look at some of the top stories of the day. A blockbuster decision from the Supreme Court striking down affirmative action in college admissions at Harvard and the University of North Carolina. The policy has long been used to increase diversity on college campuses. As expected, it was a 6-3 ruling. The conservative justices powering the decision with all three liberal justices dissenting. The ruling will likely force schools to overhaul their admissions processes now. President Biden slammed the ruling, saying, in his words, discrimination still exists in America, and today's ruling does not change that. It was a big day for Virgin Galactic, the company completing its first commercial space flight to the edge of space two years after it was originally planned. Now, the stock initially jumping on the launch, but in the end, plunging more than 10% on the day. And finally, another electric vehicle maker is getting on board with Tesla's charging standard, Polestar, saying it will adopt the supercharger network starting in 2025. All right, well, that does it for us today on Yahoo Finance. We'll see you right back here again tomorrow. Have a good night.